Sports Talk Chicago. Everett Jones and Glowman, we are back and ready for today's special guest. He's the Bears beat reporter for the Chicago Tribune and a contributor to ESPN 1000. Please welcome Dan Weeder to the program. Dan, it's great to have you on. How are you? John, good to see you again. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for being here. What was your take on this entire draft weekend for the Bears, first off? <laughs> well, first of all, Saturday afternoon was busy at Hallis Hall because <laughs> you woke up thinking that the Bears were going to maybe select three players, maybe be able to to work a trade or two and get four or five. And they wind up with eight, right? And they fill out their draft class with an 11 player draft class. And I do give Ryan Poles credit for being resourceful, right? For being creative, for being able to multiply the swings that he got to take in this draft. Now, everyone always asks, did they get anybody good? And my answer is, I don't know. We'll know in three years, right? That's how it works with the draft. You look at some of the potential of these guys, you say, okay, it's there. But math also tells us that most of the time it doesn't work out. And I think in one of the columns I wrote earlier this week, that of the last 72 players the Bears had drafted before uh, in a 10-year span from 2008 to 2017, only 16 of those 72 played a fifth season with the team. So you do the percentage math on that. You see how the pie chart shakes out four or five years from now. All these guys that we're going to be talking about today will look back and go, oh, yeah, I forgot about that guy, right? So <laughs> that's just the way it works, and hopefully there's a diamond in the rough somewhere in here. How surprising were those first two defensive fans? Um, semi. I'd say semi-surprised. Obviously, I thought going into day two, uh, we've talked forever about the need on offense, right? You need Justin to have more help at the receiver position. You need him to have more help at offensive line. But I did think that the strength of the cornerback position was there. The Bears have an obvious need there with Jalen Johnson needing someone to start next to him at nickel, someone to start across from him in the outside corner. And I thought they got a good player in Washington's Kyler Gordon there. And so you don't sort of judge that harshly because it was a, a good player who filled a need that was rated on their board as such. Then they went with Jaquan Brisker later in the round, and you say, okay, well, that's two consecutive defensive backs, right, for a team that needs help in a lot of different areas. And then you look at, obviously, some of the receivers that they had a chance and passed on, right? The, before, the first pick that they had, they could have taken Wandell Moore or John Metchie the third. When they get around to the Brisker pick, you still had Sky Moore, George Pickens, Alex Pierce on the board, and obviously some later round guys, and Jalen Tolbert, David Bell, Danny Gray, Calvin Austin, Romeo Dobbs. Those are guys that they all chose to pass on. Obviously, they addressed the receiver need in round three with Valus Jones. We'll see what he is. But it was a little surprising to go back-to-back -back defensively, and now it's all up to this coaching staff to make this front office look like geniuses by turning these guys into immediate starters and guys who can be those guys that play a fifth year in this organization. Did you prefer that strategy? I mean, the Bears obviously had a lot of opportunities for wide receivers. They passed on them for these defensive picks. Did you find that okay? Look, I, I'm a guy who likes the sizzle of the receiver position. And I liked going into this draft, studying the receiver position, knowing that it was a position of need for the Bears and seeing guys look like you like the guys that put the ball in the end zone, right? Quarterbacks, wide receivers, running backs. You like the guys that score points for you. And so it's easy to get caught up in the sizzle of that, which I admittedly do a lot. And so I probably would have used one of those two picks on a receiver if it's a guy that I loved, right? And there are guys there to love. Now, listen, the, the front office has more background on guys' personality traits and, and, and things that we'll never know about, right? Like a lot of things you heard about George Pickens out of Georgia is maybe one of the top three talents in this draft at that position, but that may have some, some character issues, some maturity issues that make him harder to bring along and, and be a long-term answer for you. So they'll have more of those answers. I personally would have gone for a receiver somewhere in there, uh, but they did get one in round three. And like, again, like, so this is going to be a real interesting process to see what they try to squeeze out of Valus Jones, because he's not a guy who is a traditional real polished route runner, who is a, a guy who's had production at the receiver position in college to a high level. He's a guy that's got some really intriguing traits. He's really fast. He's really explosive. He's really good with the ball in his hands. But now that puts the onus on Luke Getze to figure out how to make a role for him that, that works for him and then also works for Justin because I think as you and I talk all the time this all circles back to Justin and positioning him to be the guy that you think he can be do you find the Debo Samuel comparison accurate for Jones so, so I, you just have to put a box around the comparison and understand what people are saying I don't think anyone uh in the scouting community anyone in the Bears organization is saying that he's the same type of talent as Debo Samuel Debo Samuel's on the top shelf you know, Bayless Jones is a well drink for right now, right? And then, so basically <laughs> what you're looking at is the usage can be similar. You can use him out of the backfield as a, as a wide back, as Debo would call it. You can use him on jet sweeps. You can use him on the, the quick outs, right? The quick routes, the, the now routes that get the ball in his hands and let him use things. So in that regard, 
the, the parallels are there. But don't let anyone confuse this as this is the next Debo Samuel because Debo's on a, on a different level. At some point here in the next year, he's going to get $100 million that, that tell you what kind of player he is. And so uh, that's not in Bayless Jones' immediate future. But I do see the parallels in terms of skill set and the way you can use him. How concerning is the age for him? I know he's going to be 25 by first week, too. I mean, that's less a concern for me at that position um, because you can get some mileage out, out of receivers. I think the Bears will spin it as, look, this guy is a guy who played at Southern Cal in Tennessee and had six years of experience. As many guys in this draft did, took advantage of the extra year of eligibility that COVID provided, gained experience, made himself better, and so got a year of, of polish right out of that sixth year uh, in college in the last year at Tennessee. And so maybe that works to his advantage. The one thing you do hear about Bayless Jones around the league is that maturity wise and professional wise, that's not going to be a problem. Like he's going to show up at rookie mini camp this weekend. He's going to know what's expected of him. He's going to do what's expected of him. And I think there's a lot to like about a guy who's got that drive and that commitment. And now it's just how much can you squeeze out of your potential to make yourself a long-term answer? What kind of a role do you see him playing this year? I, look, I mean, that that offense is wide open for guys to have leading roles, right? So if you're one of the, the two offensive playmakers that were drafted and you've got, you know, a receiving core that, that really is Darnell Mooney as a returner and then Byron Pringle, Equinemius St. Brown, and, and maybe a Daz Newsom here or there, there, there's plenty of opportunity here for Bayless Jones to carve out a leading role. I think you look back to, to maybe like a Tariq Cohen type when he was a rookie and a, a second year guy in 17 and 18 and, and, and the kinds of things that they did with him, right? Like one of the things that made Tariq a standout those first couple of years is they used him as a chess piece and they were able to create matchups. And when he was at his best, they had him coming out of the backfield, getting matched up against the linebacker and catching passes. And so there's going to be opportunity for Bayless to get a lot of touches in this offense. I think it's just up to him to, to figure out with Luke, with Justin, where he fits best. Dan Biederberg here on Sports Talk Chicago. Dan, based on what you've seen from this draft of the Bears, how about Justin Fields, would you say? Yeah, a shrug. Uh, I, it's, it's another shrug emoji for me because it's, it, it, I don't know, even though you took four offensive linemen on day three, I don't know which of those guys is going to play this year, right? And we don't know if any of them are going to play this year. I think Ryan Poles made it pretty clear uh, both Saturday evening and since the draft ended that one of his incentives and kind of loading up on the offensive line was hey look at the minimum I want to create competition like if Tevin Jenkins and Larry Borm are going to be my starters at tackle I at least want to make them work to be my starters at tackle right and understand that this job isn't promised to you and you're going to have to grind your butt off in OTAs and mini camp and training camp to win that role and so I think that was Ryan Poles's incentive is to get that competition up there to bring in guys that that, that can potentially be starters but right now, when you look at the draft class and what they did for Justin, I, you know, and look, you, you, you're, you're handcuffed at the outset because you don't have a first round pick and you don't have a fourth round pick. And so it limits some of the, th some of the talent that you're able to, to look at. And so now it's just up to them to, to, to see what their coaching staff can squeeze out of these guys and see who can actually contribute in 2022. It'll be fascinating when we sit down in, in mid-January, early February and talk about what turned out with this draft class. Well, drafting only one wide receiver doesn't seem too much of a help though, right? No, it doesn't, right? Like, and I, I, you know, I thought, you know, hey, look, I get it. Four swings at offensive linemen. What about three offensive linemen and two receivers, just in case you could grab a guy that could show out in, in camp? And, 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 you know, look, they, they, they've gone to the undrafted free agent well, and they're going to have to continue looking at street free agents as, as the process unfolds and see where it is. Uh, I don't expect the roster that we're looking at today on, on May 5th to be the same as it looks, you know, when we get into the second preseason game. So we'll see how some of those moving parts work and what other receivers get in here. Um, but certainly you're going to need help there. And, and, and look, when, when we talk about Justin needing playmakers, it doesn't have to be strictly wide receiver, right? Like if you can get a big year three jump out of Cole Komet, if you can get a big uh, contribution out of David Montgomery, if you can turn, uh, you know, Tristan Ebner, one of the draft picks from this weekend, if he can come in and, and, and be a guy who contributes for you on special teams, but every once in a while shows up on third down and, and, and makes plays as a, as a pass catcher, well, now you're doing things to diversify your offense, to give it more uh, firepower. And, and I think this is where the trust in Luke Getze is shown from above. And now it's up to Luke to, to take, you know, some of this clay and figure out what he wants to sculpt it into. Yeah, he might have his work cut out for him there. How much of a jump do you expect Justin Fields to have this year? Yeah, I, I want to caution people to bring the bar down 
just a little bit because you got to understand, like even Justin said, when we had a chance to speak to him at the, the first mini camp in April, it's not easy to go into your second season forced to reboot, right? To learn a whole new offense under a whole new coordinator and a whole new system and a whole new concept of plays. And so there is a lot that goes with that. You don't find a lot of quarterbacks who have system changes after their rookie season, particularly a guy like Justin, who, who made 10 starts. And obviously the second half of his season, as we've talked about previously, was interrupted by a lot of different things. And he didn't have that, that momentum building into 2022. I think it's going to be a, a growing pains year for Justin Fields. And that's hard to listen to as a Chicago fan, because all we've listened to for 10 years is up. Oh, more growing pains, new system, new quarterback, new system and new quarterback. Like, there's been so many of these reboots that it's hard to hear. But uh, again, Justin Herbert, the outlier in terms of guys who had a explosive second year with a new coach and new system. I think Justin's going to take some time. And I think all you really want to see is what we were hoping to see last year is just kind of uh, gradual growth throughout the year and, and, and a sense that he understands what he's seeing but in terms of explosive numbers i'm not expecting that at all because i think it is going to be a learning process in a lot of ways for this entire team what's going to be your criteria in judging his progress yeah i think i think it's a, a lot of it's going to be the eye test john i think it's going to be that that you know some of those big splash plays that we saw last year you think of you know the run that he made on fourth down that, that at soldier field that scored the touchdown you think of the big plays he made in Pittsburgh to rally them from behind to uh, take the lead in that game on Monday Night Football. You think of some of those big plays. You want to see those on a regular basis, right? You also want to see that the ball security is there, that there are fewer fumbles, that there are fewer interceptions, that it looks like he knows where he's going with the ball when the ball needs to go where it needs to go, right? And I think some of this is just going to be us watching with our eyes and saying, aha, yeah, that's what upper te upper tier quarterback in the NFL looks like. And hopefully there's more of that than, uh, than the other, right? Because we've lived through the other forever and it's time for Chicago fans to see some of that on a more regular basis. How patient are you willing to be with him in his development? How patient am I or how patient are they? I think both. Let's go with both. <laughs> because I, I, you know, I think the patience ask is one of the most interesting things for this new regime because they should not be held accountable for the mistakes of their predecessors, but yet they have to understand that this city is on edge because of the mistakes of their many predecessors, right? Like this is an organization <laughs> that hasn't had three consecutive winning seasons since 1988. This is an organization that's tried and tried and tried again to get the quarterback position right and failed. And so there is going to be a level of outrage that mushrooms up inevitably if Justin has a three-week span in October that doesn't look real good, right? And that patience level is going to be like, what is going wrong? You know, and they got to be inside the building. They got to be prepared for that and have a plan to be, hold on, we got this. We're developing with a new coordinator. We're developing a young quarterback who's got some talent. So, you, you know, like, my patience is, is going to be properly calibrated. The fans' patience is going to be improperly calibrated. And the coaching staff's <laughs> patience is probably going to be too high, right? Because people are going to say, let's go. It's time to go now. We're tired of sitting around in the afterthought in the NFL conversation. It's going to be really interesting to, to feel that dynamic. You know how this city is, and you know how it reacts. And you, you understand that it reacts justifiably, given their decades-long frustration with this organization. Are you confident in this coaching staff to develop fields? I need to see a lot, right? Like we don't know a lot about Luke Getze as a quarterback developer. We don't know what Matt Eberflus will do as a defensive coach who also now has to understand that one of your most important relationships in the building is the one you have with Justin. And how are you carving out time to, to help Justin along as a defensive vision minded guy? Can you sit down with him on a weekly basis and teach him the things that you see as a defensive coach that he's not mastering, right? Can Luke do the same things? And so this is, this is a, a, a real wait and see with a lot of people in this organization. you got a first-time GM, a first-time coach, a young quarterback, a coordinator that, you know, is, is going to be calling plays here for the first time since he tried it in college. And, and they're just, there's a lot of see it to believe it here. And we're not going to get a chance to really see anything significant until we get to September. Dan Biederberg is still here on Sports Talk Chicago. Dan, a few more questions before we finish up. First off, your reaction to the Nick Foles release was what? Yeah, I mean, that was, honestly, John, that was a when, not if kind of situation. I think the Bears tried for months to see if they could get a taker, right? Like, hey, does anybody want Nick? Like, <laughs> we'd love a seventh rounder, you know? Love a sixth, but if you give us a, a seventh, we'll take it. Like, just give us anything 
for Nick, you know, and it didn't work out. And so, you know, obviously they try and sign Trevor Simeon uh, a month and a half ago, and he'll be here as, as Justin's backup. And, and the guy as the veteran in that room, but I, I think more than anything, it's just another one of these head scratchers, John, because you remember when they went out and signed Nick to be sort of the safety net under Mitch Trubisky, and then the safety net ended up having a hole in it, right? And you went right through the safety net and hit the ground to the point where then the, the relationship between Nick Foles and Matt Nagy was so strained and so untenable that they had to go then get Andy Dalton, right? And I think that's what a lot of fans in Chicago were upset about is that you had to spend resources to go sign a veteran backup a year after you signed, you traded for a veteran backup and Nick Foles. And it's like, well, what are we doing? Why do we keep having to, 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 to replace parts that we should already have in position? And so there's just, there's just, it's maddening when you look back and you see the results of this, this organization. And then you see the number of missteps that create a resource drain that create the failure on the field. And, and that's kind of what Nick represents here. Look, we'll always have the Atlanta game in 2020, right? You, you always have the, the Nick Foles beating Tom Brady and then getting snubbed on a handshake on that Thursday night, the same season. Don't forget about uh, Christmas Eve, or I was at Christmas, I can't even remember anymore, but in Seattle last year in the snow globe in Seattle with Nick Foles leading that comeback win and the, the amazing pass to Demir Bird on the conversion to win it. Those are some high moments for Nick, but there certainly weren't enough of them. Was that the best move of draft weekend for the Bears? Had to have been, right? Well, I mean, it's just an inevitable move, honestly, and 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 we'll see. We'll see where it goes. I mean, like, man, it's just like we just have these quarterback conversations in different forms every spring, every summer, every fall, every winter, and it's just like I said this to somebody in the middle of April when we were talking about drafts. It's like you would love in Chicago one season to go into like an off-season program where you're like, oh, the quarterback's position we don't really need to talk about because it's a standout starter who's been doing the same thing for four or five years, right? Like, and we just know what we're getting them. And like, what must it be like in Kansas City or Green Bay or, you know, these other places where they just show up for OTAs and they're like, our quarterback's perfect. It's solid. We're good. They're like, we don't have to spend time talking about it, worrying about it, stressing about it. Let's just roll. And, and, and one of these days, maybe Chicago gets, gets that, that luxury. And Dan, before we finish up today, last question, what's the best draft you've covered since you started covering the Bears? Help me with the, the parameters of that, because I, I, I like my, my, my urge is to say 2017, just because of the, because of the significance of it, just how landmark it was. Right. And understanding that on the Thursday night of that draft, the Bears moved up from number three to number two to take, Oh, by the way, Mitch Trubisky. Right. And then, and then even in the, in the moment you said, boy, this is, this is landmark. This is momentous. One way or another, this pick is going to define Ryan Pace's legacy. In fact, it does, right? And, and it's why Ryan is no longer here, unfortunately, because it didn't work out. Um, that had the most sizzle to it, right? Like uh, of all the drafts I've covered, I feel like that is the one that that will forever stand out. And, and you hope one of these years that like you, you have a top 10 pick, right? And you turn that top 10 pick into a, a, a perennial all pro and a potential all famer, right? Like that's, that's the dream, right? And, and they just haven't had enough of that. Again, this draft, another one where you sit out all of Thursday night and you're just sitting there as a spectator as 32 players get picked and you go, boy, it would be nice to play in that party uh, tonight. And then it's not there. My promise to you, Bears will have a top 10 pick in 2023. <laughs> so, I don't know if that's a fun promise or not, but, but, but hopefully they get that swing again next year. Is it frustrating to cover mediocrity like this every year? <laughs> is that my answer? That, there's my answer for you. Yes, it is frustrating <laughs> to cover mediocrity like this every year because it is just a tires in the mud spinning exercise. And I, I, I've told people a lot that 2018 was an awesome year to cover. It was a thrill because that team built momentum. They believed they won a championship. They entered January as a team that had legitimate aspirations that they could be in the Super Bowl conversation. And you thought, man, wouldn't it be fun to do this several years in a row, right? And it, we've never done it several years in a row, not since I've been on the beat. And again, when I go back to that stat, they haven't had three consecutive winning seasons since 1988. I mean, wow, right? I mean, that's, that, that's, that's the wow moment for this organization. And so I, I don't know how it gets turned. Um, you've rebooted again with another GM that's got to try to get it turned. And I think Ryan Poles is doing a good job with his vision, his patience, his discipline. Now it's just a matter of, taking three, four years to get several draft classes, several free agency classes and have the, the roster exactly how you want it. Oh, by the way, got to get the quarterback right. <laughs>
three to four years sounds like more torture. But Dan, thank you for coming on and being on the beat and reporting about all these great things that are going on in Bears land. Really appreciate the time as always. I always enjoy the conversation. 